Greetings to the brightest audience in California. I am Bob Enyar, and thank you again, Dr. Vern Bissell, for inviting Real Science Radio to participate here on the Pepperdine campus in this Science Creation Legacy event. That uh, is my co-host there. Fred is the funny-looking one on the right. Uh, Fred Williams is a software engineer and creation speaker. And for our Real Science Radio Caveman show, we took this publicity shot at Red Rocks Park just down the road from our studio in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. So that was not photoshopped. That's an actual photograph. In a moment, I'll show you three photos of the insides of an animal. A photo that shocked the world of paleontology. What we're going to talk about is the greatest discovery in the history of paleontology. Yet the general public in the U.S., around the world, they're unfamiliar with this information. Even though it's been published in many of the world's leading, most prestigious science journals. Now, this photo, these photos I'm going to show you, young earth creationists love them, while most atheists hated them, and evolutionists. They hated these photos. How could you hate a photo? They hated these photos. And I'll tell you why we loved it and understood it immediately. It's, it's because of this. Jesus quoted from this chapter of the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 1. In fact, every author of the New Testament quoted from at least one of the early chapters of Genesis. And Jesus also referenced Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. And if I think about it, he also referenced Genesis chapter 4 and Genesis chapter 5 and Genesis chapter 6 and Genesis chapter 7. You get the idea. And based on how often he quoted from them, one of the Lord's favorite books was Exodus, which, as we all know, in chapter 20, reads, In six days God created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. And the first two Gospels record Jesus teaching that God made us male and female at the beginning of creation, not after millions of years, as so many Christian colleges are now teaching their students, but at the beginning of creation. And Jesus in the Gospels presents the global flood of Noah's day as a historical event, and so do the epistles. It is because creationists also take the flood as history that we love, and we could immediately understand these photographs. Now, what animal died that left these parts of its body for scientists to photograph. Well, these tiny bits of tissue, this, these photos are taken through a microscope. So the, these are not slabs at the butcher shop, but they are from bones of an animal that have been broken open, and they have appeared, photos like these and dozens of others, have appeared in some of the world's leading scientific publications. You think they're from a lamb? or the carcass of a goat, or a pig. No, these photographs are from a Tyrannosaurus rex. <coughs> Excuse me. A T-Rex excavated in Montana out of the Hell Creek Formation, and that's soft sedimentary rock. Regardless of how careful a creationist is, or his track record for being accurate and fact-checking, uh, Many people distrust anything a creationist says. So I like folks to see the actual scientists describe their own discovery of dinosaur soft tissue as presented by a non-Christian media outlet at CBS News from 60 Minutes with Dr. Mary Schweitzer and the world-renowned paleontologist Jack Horner, who was the technical advisor on the Jurassic Park movies with Steven Spielberg. So let's hear from them. What happened next happened by mistake. Mary put some fragments of the bone in acid to dissolve away the outermost layer of mineral. 
but the acid worked too fast and all the mineral dissolved away. Being a fossil, there should have been nothing left. But there was, and it was elastic, like living tissue. This is the piece. <gasps> no. She showed us video she took under the microscope. That's really what happened? Yes. That's the dinosaur yeah. bone? Without mineral now. That's what was left. It looked like the soft tissue she would have expected to find if it had been modern bone. This was impossible. This bone was 68 million years old. So you see this and you think, what? You see, I didn't you want say, to tell anybody. <laughs> you'd be ridiculed, yes. right? And so I, I said to my technician, okay, do it again. I don't believe it. And yet, in sample after sample, they were there. Things that looked suspiciously like flexible, transparent blood vessels. She finally mustered the courage to tell Jack. She said she dissolved the bone away and there were blood vessels. And, you know, I was like, shocked. I mean, how could that be? How could that be? That's right. The things Mary was finding inside dinosaur bones. Look at that blood vessels, and even what seem to be intact cells pose a radical challenge to the existing rules of science. That organic material can't possibly survive even a million years, let alone 68 million. Mary, Jack, and their team published their B-Rex findings in a series of papers in the journal Science and were promptly attacked. Critics said their samples might have been contaminated or that the supposed blood vessels were actually something called biofilm, a type of slime. But as Mary showed us, she's been able to replicate her findings. These are pieces of an even older dinosaur, a well-preserved 80 million year old duckbill. When she dissolved it away in acid... Let's put this under the scope here. Well, look. Is that a blood vessel? This is a blood vessel. You see the branches right there? And look at all of them. And it's so consistent over and over and over again. We do this bone and it comes out and I get excited every time. I can't help it. I mean, 80 million years old. Mary published her new results last year. And while some of her critics have been swayed, the controversy still rages. And the stakes are high. If blood vessels can survive 80 million years, what about DNA? Yeah, what about DNA? Well, that video was made a couple years ago. Since then, there have been more publications. We'll talk about that. Try to Google this. If you Google three words, dinosaur soft tissue, I've mentioned that the general public, they don't, understand, they don't know that this discovery has been made. Now, we have been trying to change that, and there has been some progress. But if people Google dinosaur soft tissue, those three words, uh, we're pretty thrilled because of the results of years of hard work. Uh, our website ranks anywhere from three to two to one on dinosaur soft tissue. It changes as the weeks go on. That's been consistent for years now. The reason is that we have put online on a single web page, it's a long page, but we have created a comprehensive catalog of every peer-reviewed journal paper ever published on dinosaur soft tissue. So we have a brief excerpt, explain what they found, you could get the direct paper, and so of the dinosaur papers, there's a dozen or so, but then we have supplemental material and we have a list of about 70 peer-reviewed published papers of soft tissue in dinosaurs from the Mesozoic layer and even lower, even down to Precambrian. Uh, and they keep getting older and older and older fossils that they break them open and they say, um, maybe we should look inside here because Mary Schweitzer, who's become famous, found soft tissue. And it turns out that when paleontologists and microbiologists, they now work together on teams. This is brand new. When they get together, it is not difficult to find dinosaur bones with soft tissue. 150 years ago, because of Charles Darwin and Charles Lyell and others, uniformitarianism, they believe these fossils were millions of years old. Because of them, and since the advent especially of the electron microscope, now, for many decades, the world has lost the opportunity 
to study much more soft tissue because it's been decomposing. It doesn't last for 80 million years, but it does last for thousands of years. So we have lost half a century. By the way, other terms that Real Science Radio does well with, Young Earth, uh, three out of 87 million. Uh, should Christians judge, one of our favorite topics, three out of two and a half million. Uh, Jesus commanded us to judge rightly, so we, we have a neat article on that. And finally, Big Bang Predictions. Our last film, our last video was on the global flood. And this year, this summer, due out from Real Science Radio, is our list of evidence against the Big Bang. And we're just thrilled that while NASA says it's the predictions of the Big Bang that prove they confirm the theory, when, when students Google Big Bang predictions, uh, we beat NASA, we beat the Smithsonian, we beat Wikipedia, we beat all these sites. Uh, because we have, again, a complete list of all the predictions of the Big Bang and what was the actual results of those predictions. So uh, that's coming out this summer, but coming out before that, uh, of course, Steven Spielberg, uh, his film will get more attention, Jurassic World, June 12th. Well, we have uh, worked with a video production company out of Texas called uh, God in a Nutshell, and for some reason, they're Christians, they're young earth creationists, they, they've got a knack of getting a million views per video on YouTube. I don't know how they do it. They have minimal production budget. But um, they flew out to Denver, and so we filmed at our uh, humble Real Science Radio studio interviews. with Tre Trey Smith is the producer there, and uh, Bob Enyart. So that's coming in June, timed to Steven B Spielberg's film. Now, we don't know... Uh, because we haven't seen the film, uh, but is there a possibility that in the storyline they're going to talk about the discovery of dinosaur soft tissue? Is that possible? Well, it sure is. Jack Horner, who was the technical advisor on the first three films, in the case of, of reality imitating art, his team in Montana, they're the ones who discovered the first soft tissue T-Rex that became well known within the scientific community. So at any rate, there's an image from one of the Jurassic Park movies, and there's Jack Horner with Steven Spielberg. Uh, here on, uh, on a set is Jack Horner talking to, who's that actor, Sam Neill, from the film. By the way, the author, Michael Crichton, who wrote the original Jurassic Park uh, book, he used Jack Horner and one other paleontologist as his models for the character in the story, Alan Grant. So Jack Horner was part of the story from the beginning. And as far as I know, he still is. Um, he was at the Smithsonian talking about not only the films, but the discovery of soft tissue, as we see right here. Behind him, that's a... A, that is biological tissue from a hadrosaur, a duck-billed dinosaur. We went up to the Museum of the Rockies in Montana, and I was there with two of our boys. We have seven boys. That's Zachary and Michael. And uh, there's Zach uh, being eaten by a T-Rex, and there's Jack Horner by the same skull, but only at a different time, in different lighting. And you can see here, this card is for uh, Bob Harmon. Um, Bob Harmon is on staff at the museum, and when Jack Horner's team was out in Montana, Bob Harmon is the one who spotted the bone uh, coming out of the side of a cliff that was eroding. That's how many bones are discovered. And so that T-Rex was named B-Rex for Bob Harmon. There's another Wankel T-Rex. There are a couple of the early ones that really uh, caught the attention of the scientists. Here's the site. And so you see that this is just um, soft uh, sedimentary layers. It's not like these bones were hermetically sealed 
to make sure they couldn't decay. They're in sandstone in Montana and all over the world because there are dinosaur fossils being excavated uh, from around the world that have soft tissue and also, as you probably have heard, they have a lot of carbon-14 in them uh, and carbon-14, which has a very short half-life, 5,730 years, it should all be gone in 50,000 years or, sh or so. There should be none left. Dinosaur bones from around the world have been carbon-14 dated, and they show plenty of carbon-14. Carbon-14 is in coal, oil, gas, and even in diamonds. So when the evolutionists say, well, it's contamination, well, you sure can't get contamination inside of a diamond. That's the hardest known substance naturally occurring on Earth. But at any rate, loads of evidence that these are young. So we asked Jack Horner, and I'll, I'll play you audio of a phone call. We sent him a letter. We sent a grant offer. Eventually, we kept raising the amount of money we were offering him to, do, to carbon date his soft tissue T-Rex. And he turned us down. He said, at one point, he said, well, I'll talk to Mary about it. Maybe we'll do it. Maybe we won't. But we started with $10,000. It cost $3,000 to run the test. We went up to twenty. dollars we said, hey, we'll pay for the test and a $20,000 grant. In his museum, it's a very humble museum. It's not like they couldn't use the $20,000. But um, so let's hear. Somebody so took the, the audio of the call. And why they don't want to test their soft tissue T-Rex mine for carbon-14. Why not? Because they're going to find it. Hello, can I speak to Jack Horner? Um, yeah, who's calling? This is Bob Enyart with KLTT Radio in Denver, Colorado. That's Bob Enyart. Um, yeah, let me transfer you over to his office. I think he should be in there right now. Yellow. Hello, Jack. This is Bob Enyart with KLTT Radio in Denver. Uh -huh. How are you doing? Good. Jack, I sent a letter to Bob Harmon a few weeks back offering the museum a grant of $8,000 to do a carbon-14 date test of that soft tissue T-Rex you guys dug up. And he said he would forward that to you. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you saw that or considered it. Well, um, um. Carbon-14 doesn't is, work on something that old. I, I understand that, and normally we wouldn't expect to get soft tissue out of a T-Rex skeleton either, but sometimes science proceeds by crossing your T's and dotting your I's, and you guys might have other things you'd like to carbon-14 at the same time. In fact, in the last couple of weeks, I've been able to raise a little more money, so that's up to $10,000 now that we'd be honored to give you guys if you would consider doing that test. Well, we can't do that test. You can't do that? No. Do you mean the museum doesn't have the laboratory? We certainly don't. Okay, well, we're happy to pay the expense of having a lab do the test in addition to the $10,000 to the museum. Um, <laughs> uh. Do you know how carbon-14 works? Yeah, I'm familiar, and I realize it's useless for anything over maybe 50,000 years or so. But I've done a talk show in Denver for 15 years, and mm -hmm. there's a group of folks interested in science. Of course, that discovery caught their attention, and they thought, well, it'd be logical to do this, to just go ahead and do it, even though nobody would be inclined to do it, just like nobody would be inclined to look for soft tissue inside right. of a T-Rex. Well, yeah, and, you know, we're still trying to figure out what it is, what it's right. actually made of. Right, exactly, whether it's a hemoglobin or whatever. Well, yeah. I don't know. Um, Jack, is the amount too small that it's just not worth the consideration? No, that's not it. Okay. Um, 
what if I were able to raise more money? No, that the amount of money has nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. Um, because carbon fourteen doesn't work on something like this, right? Your results that you get could be all over the place. Well, they should be infinity. It should be not datable. In other words, it shouldn't come back saying it's 25,000 years old. Right. It should be infinity. And so well, that'll be a worthwhile... Well, infinity, infinity isn't exactly what you get. Okay. I mean, it's like, like trying to date a piece of concrete. Right. You wouldn't have to have carbon in it. Right. You wouldn't use carbon-14. Now, the skeleton is not fossilized. Isn't that true, or largely not? Well, it's, it's you know, the, the bone is made of calcium phosphate. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, like I say, we're still trying to figure out what the actual soft tissue is. Right. And see, we were hoping that a test like this would just add a, another bit of scientific information that mm-hmm. that you would have at your disposal. And also, in that grant letter, we asked if it could be a blind test with five different specimens. And therefore, then the museum could test four other specimens that you might want to have carbon-14 dated. And so you could put it all in the same batch and those testing, then, will pay the cost of that. That'll be free to the museum plus the $10,000 grant. Um, let, let, me, let me tell you where I'm coming from here. Sure. All right? Obviously, your group is a group of creationists. Yes. And... and um, And the spin they can get off of it, right? Doing it is well, not going to help. Not going to help us. Yeah. So even though it's just a scientific test, they're they're not well, asking it's, for it's voodoo not or a, anything. It's not actually a scientific test. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Carbon fourteen dating something with soft tissue in it. Jack, if I could raise twenty thousand dollars, would it be worth? I will talk to Mary Schweitzer about it. Okay, okay. I appreciate that. And how about this? I'll resend you the grant letter with the amount of twenty thousand in it, and then you could talk to Mary, and we'll see where it goes. I I want to know what group is sponsoring it. Okay, mm-hmm. it's um. I, have... I I mean I need I need some. Really specific details about sure. And don't just you know tell it to me straight. Of okay? course, I've hosted <laughs> I've hosted a daily talk show for fifteen years. We're on a fifty thousand watt AM station KLTT, mm-hmm. and there's a local church here, Denver Bible Church, mm-hmm. that's offered to help. But we also have pledges from any number of individuals in the Denver community. Okay. So we could, if you guys agree, we could send you the check within 24 hours. Okay. Well, let me talk to Mary, and let me just talk to a few people. Okay. Because I don't want to, you know, I can't afford to have it turn into a circus. Right. Well, I do understand that, and I appreciate your time. Okay. I, I will see Mary this next week. Oh, that's fabulous. I'd be happy to call you back in two weeks from now. Mm hmm All right. Thank you so much, Jack. You're very welcome. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. (laughs) So you uh, uh, you don't carbon-14 date something you know is millions of years old. Well, you would have never thought there'd be soft tissue in there. He said, we don't know what it is. It was real obvious what it was, but to them it couldn't be what what it appeared to be. So now fast forward to 2015. And their results have been verified. So many proteins have been sequenced by Harvard and institutions around the world. And they, uh, they don't want a carbon-14 date their dinosaur soft tissue. So, um, but uh, other people 
uh, will and are doing those kinds of uh, research projects. So did they decline the 20,000? Yes, yeah, so they eventually uh, declined, and it was for the grant offer letter is online at Real Science Radio, rsr.org slash Horner, and you can see the letter we sent them. It's scanned onto the web page. So Jesus said that man wasn't made. Uh, well, what Jesus said was man was made at the beginning of the creation, and so that doesn't mean at the end. And even Christian colleges think that uh, the Big Bang is true. Uh, that's what they teach their kids, their future ministers. And they think that theistic evolution is true. They reject the literal reading of Genesis. And so if, that, if they were right, then man was created after billions of years. 13.7 billion years later, after God created, that's when man came on the scene. Uh, so, and even after the earth, they say four and a half billion years later. Jesus said at the beginning of creation. That's why we're not surprised when we see dinosaur tissue in bones that is reminiscent of the results of Egyptian mummies. Because Egyptian mummies, they're thousands of years old, but uh, there are traces of soft tissue in their bones also. Uh, this slide is just uh, for those who have confidence in the geological column to try to open up a bit of doubt. Because the USGS, the United States Geological Survey, they say, as do all mainstream geologists, that when you look at the strata, the layers of the Grand Canyon, I've been there a dozen times rafting in the Colorado River, studying the geology there just as an amateur as a radio talk show host. Uh, the USGS and all textbooks, basically, standard textbooks, say that there's actually many millions of years of sedimentary deposits and of erosion missing in these layers. So you see the biggest gap is where they say there is 100 million years missing all of what they call the Ordovician and the Silurian, all of it missing. And the astounding thing is all that time could pass and there was no erosion to speak of and no sedimentary deposits. If you travel the world or maybe even just where you live, uh, we went to Ephesus in Turkey and the change of the terrain since the time of Paul is stunning. And that's 2,000 years. So a million years is a million years, a lot more than 2,000. So right here, 120 million years. And what this shows us is it's not true. Their claim that these layers took tens of millions of years to form, hundreds of millions, is not true. Uh, the red wall limestone, you could see that there, 500 feet thick. Um, nautiloid fossils are throughout the basal layer, the last the bottom seven feet of the red wall limestone, every square meter approximately, there's one nautiloid fossil. And eight, one out of eight of them are buried in a vertical position. So the standard textbook account of how limestone forms is at the bottom of a shallow placid sea, uh, creatures, shellfish are dying, and the grains settle to the bottom one grain at a time, and it builds up over hundreds of thousands and millions of years. If that were true, how could millions of nautiloids be killed and 12% of them be buried vertically? Of course, that's not possible. They'd have to be dead and standing up for hundreds of thousands of years. So... Uh, the geologic column was laid down rapidly as a result of a global flood, and that's why we shouldn't be surprised to see uh, soft tissue in the fossils of creatures killed in the flood. This is also from a T-Rex, a blood vessel, a red blood cells. This is from a hadrosaur that was mentioned on 60 Minutes. They say this is 80 million years old, so there's the creature, they say, um, well, there, it, that creature, its bones, uh, 
yielded up this soft tissue right here. You can see there an osteocyte uh, toward the left with its little philopodia, um, extremely fine biological structures that have survived. A mosasaur, ancient uh, extinct marine reptile, they say 80 million years old, and lo and behold, soft tissue from a small bone. You know, at first they said, well, the reason we got soft tissue, well, the vast majority of scientists rejected it. But um, the outcry against soft tissue from scientists has uh, been almost completely sil silenced. The most prominent scientist who came out against soft tissue and they published, it was just biofilm, They've, uh, I've corresponded with some of them. They're no longer interested in arguing that it's not dinosaur soft tissue. But so they said, well, it's because it was a big bone buried in, uh, in, in a certain way in Montana. And then they found soft tissue in little bones. And this mosasaur was a small bone. They found it in skin, in feathers, in eggshells. So biological material. So it, it's not the kind of bone it's in. Uh, it's not the kind of sediment uh, environment it's in. It's in marine deposits, uh, land deposits. Archaeopteryx, extinct bird. A new scientist reported, really startling, it shocked them. Uh, they wrote this. Uh, this. They took an Archaeopteryx fossil and they looked at it more carefully and they said it boasts more than just impressions of long gone feathers. One of the world's most famous fossils, Archaeopteryx, also contains remnants of the feathers soft tissue. It's, and this is all excerpt from the article. It's amazing that the chemistry is preserved after 150 million years. And that would be amazing. Paleontologists had long thought that only impressions remained, but there is soft tissue chemistry preserved in places that people didn't expect it, said that one geochemist. So the Archaeopteryx, uh, there's not enough biological material for us to call it soft tissue, but it is biological material. To be tissue, you have to have enough that it forms some kind of a structure. Uh, blood is considered tissue by biologists. But um, if you have tissue and it's deteriorating, at some point you no longer have the structure that was called tissue, but you still have the original biological material. That's what they found with Archaeopteryx. Not a lot of it, but they found some. So the dinosaurs and other Mesozoic creatures that have yielded up soft tissue include Hadrosaur, Titanosaur, and Ornithomimosaur, uh, that is a, um, that's an ostrich-like dinosaur. Mosasaur, Triceratops, Lufen Lufengasaur, now that was discovered in China. Uh, the name means Lefend lizard, and it looks like a typical long-necked dinosaur, Lufengasaur, and a T-Rex, and as we mentioned, Archaeopteryx. So these are dinosaurs, and we threw in a Mosasaur there and an Archaeopteryx, but so many other organisms, species, have left behind their endogenous tissue, their, the soft tissue that grew within the animal. The scientific journals that have published these discoveries. And again, we have at Real Science Radio, rsr.org slash soft tissue slash dinosaur soft tissue, however you want to do it. We have the, the world's most comprehensive catalog of every peer-reviewed paper. So you can just go down the list. It's in chronological order. Click on it. I've read all the papers and many of the related papers. Uh, but you find that they have been published in the world's leading journals, the journal Nature and Science and PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and PLUS One, Public Library of Science One, 
in the Proceedings of the Royal Society in their biology journal in Bone. And Bone is where Mary Schweitzer and her team published the powerful evidence for dinosaur DNA. Powerful evidence. They have histones that have been sequenced. Now, the histone protein, if you recall from your epigenetic study, you know, the DNA will wrap itself around histones. So in a cell, in the nucleus of a cell, a dinosaur cell, an osteocyte, they have histone proteins, and then they did multiple tests for double helix structure, and those test results are positive. And so they have, and they're very cautious, of course, and that's wise, and that's good, um, but they have DNA from a hadrosaur and from a T-Rex. Now, it's not been sequenced, at least I don't know the latest, of course, in the past year since Mary published that, but uh, they would love, just as they have now sequenced dinosaur proteins, they would love to sequence some of the dinosaur uh, genome, and that would be tremendous. Creationists love the discoveries. We love the science. Uh, we love the finds. We disagree on the interpretation. Uh, Journal of Paleontology, Acta Histochemica. That is uh, a friend of Real Science Radio, Mark Armitage. You might know his name, uh, if I could be so bold to say one of the guys here at Pepperdine is David Coppage. David, thank you for what an honor that you've joined us today. David worked for Jet Propulsion Labs for NASA on the Cassini Saturn mission for many years, and he uh, administered the ground computers. And uh, because David is a creationist, he shared an intelligent design video with a coworker like he had done occasionally in the past. And she got very offended and uh, complained to David's boss. And one thing led to another, and he was fired. So um, that's uh, sort of typical. Ben Stein, his movie Expelled. Uh, Jerry Bergman has written his uh, volumes, The Slaughter of the Dissidents. We've had Jerry in studio talking about that very work. Well, another uh, victim of that casualty is Mark Armitage, who was the electron microscope director at Cal State Northridge, and not far from here. And uh, my wife Cheryl and I, we toured the lab. Mark gave us such a wonderful, spent half a day there learning how to use those microscopes. And he went with a microbiologist, Kevin Anderson, and they went up to Montana. They spent a day digging, one day. They dug up a triceratops horn, bring it back to the lab, slice it open, and plenty of soft tissue. In fact, Mark Armitage's photos rivaled anything Mary Schweitzer ever produced, and he got it published in a very a highly respected journal, Acta Histochemica. The day the paper is published, and Mark is so excited, he is terminated that day. And so now there's a lawsuit uh, in Mark's case. So that was Acta Histochemica. By, by the way, the biological material that has been found in these fossils as of May 2015 include blood vessels. These are transparent and flexible blood vessels from dinosaurs. Red blood cells, including hemoglobin. Oh, how do they know it was hemoglobin? One of the early tests they did, they took some of the stuff and injected it in lab rats, and the lab rats produced antibodies for hemi, for biological iron. So that's pretty powerful evidence that you don't have biofilm, you don't have bacteria, you have red blood cells with hemoglobin from dinosaurs. They have now sequenced many proteins, including tubulin. That's the protein for building the microstructures. If you've seen the incredible animations put out by the Discovery Institute and others of uh, transport proteins marching along a little highway that's being built right in front of it to transport resources from one end of the cell to another. Uh, these tubulin proteins build 
those microtubules. Collagen, actin, hemoglobin, these have been sequenced now. At first, when they just did the antibodies test, they were saying, what is this stuff? Then they think it's hemoglobin, so they start to sequence it, and lo and behold, they know exactly what it is. Osteocyte cells, they are the uh, bone maintenance cells. Our bones change based on the stresses and as we grow in our lives. And so part of our bones are alive, and those cells are so complicated, and we have them in all their brilliant glory. The philopodia, the tiny uh, threads that reach out from the cells to touch other cells to communicate through the, uh, I forget what it's called, in our bones, the canicula, the little, uh, the little canals that allow the, bo the cells to communicate with each other. So we even have those tiny, tiny threads, so delicate. DNA-related histones and powerful evidence for DNA. All right, so that's what's been found. By the way, when I mentioned uh, we list our uh, our list of peer-reviewed dinosaur soft tissue papers. Real Science Radio has been become known for that, and we just love our list of not-so-old things, list of evidence against the Big Bang, which I'll be presenting that later this afternoon at the Chinese Bible Church in West L.A. Uh, we have list of scholars doubting Darwin, list of the fine-tuning of the cosmos. Each of these are radio programs, and written pages uh, on the internet. List of shocked evolutionists, so much fun. It's really absolutely wonderful. Um, so, and that's just a screenshot of, now most of our lists look nicer than this, but this is the supplemental material to the dinosaur soft tissue discoveries. That's just part of the list. And so each of these, you get the date the paper was published, the soft tissue that was found, and the claimed age of the soft tissue. Now, this is, we've uh, worked with Brian Thomas at ICR. Uh, I've been with him. He's the world's leading expert on dinosaur soft tissue, and in fact, fossil soft tissue. Uh, he initially uh, created this list. It was only a JPEG. Uh, he and I in, uh, have talked. We took that list and turned it into an actual text-based character-based list and a spreadsheet. This is a shared Google Doc, shared with the whole world. And so it's all searchable and it's alive. You could click on the links. And then we've been updating it in the last few years. And back to one of the dinosaurs that started it all. This is in the uh, museum in Montana, Museum of the Rockies. And, and now uh, that that Wankel T-Rex, um, that's one that yielded soft tissue. This was a big display, and they're really bragging that they found soft tissue. Well, it's, the whole exhibit is gone now. If you go there, uh, we, we would go, whenever we go to Montana, we're in the Denver area, we'd always go to the museum. So we'd go, I've, I've got some other guests with me, to show them, and the exhibit's gone. So we ask, where's the exhibit? Oh, it was shipped to the Smithsonian. Now, I'm afraid that it's sitting in storage in a basement somewhere in Washington, D.C., with, with other uh, treasures that bureaucrats will never let see the light of day. But what they do have there uh, at this museum where this was discovered is they have just a poster exhibit on a, a wall that as the traffic walks through the museum, it's on a little wall. It'd be like on that wall right there. Everybody walks by it. Nobody looks at that poster. You have to turn around and look at a little piece of a wall to see, by the way, we once discovered soft tissue here from dinosaurs. So they've played it down. Um, you can see they talk about what they found, uh, blood vessel, canals, and cell-like objects. Now they know a lot more about what it is. Dr. Mary Schweitzer and I think we've talked all about that, and traces of DNA may have been found. And you could also read that it uh, died in a river. Uh, that's uh, typical. Uh, so often dinosaur, you know, we have in Colorado, Dinosaur National Monument, it's Utah and Colorado border. 
And uh, I've been there where the head of an allosaur was excavated. We were there with part of the team that excavated the skull, the world's most complete skull, excavated by young earth creationists. It had wood in its mouth. The wood was part fossilized, part colified, and part organic. Uh, they should rename Dinosaur National Monument. They should call it Clam National Monument because there's way more clams than there are dinosaurs. And it seems that wherever you go in the world, you find land anim animals buried with, you know, it could be sometimes uh, freshwater clams, but also uh, fossils of marine life, and that's common. Um, this here, the dinosaur death pose, uh, Jack Horner's museum tried to figure out how the next bend like that, and they published a paper, and they, they couldn't figure it out. But in 2011, new scientists ran a report that uh, at Brigham Young University in Utah, researchers thought, well, let's take chicken carcasses and just drop them in water, and let's see what happens. And they did that. Now, Horner's team, they said they tried salt water, they couldn't get this to happen. They dropped them in water, easy to replicate their results. They said it happens every time. And the head just lunges back and the neck becomes arched and it happens almost immediately and the longer it stays in the water, the more severe the death pose becomes. So um, that's pretty interesting, I think. Uh, these fossils around the world, uh, they are a result of... Um, the global flood, uh, the vast majority of them. We have to look at the particulars of any given uh, find to see the sedimentary layers. Is it post-flood or from during the flood? Uh, so do you know what this means? It means this. It means that man and dinosaurs coexisted on Earth because these dinosaur bones look very similar to the bones of Egyptian mummies. They're only thousands of years old, so just like with the mummies, we should expect some soft tissue, but not a tremendous amount, but it should be there around the world wherever we look. This is the grant letter that we sent, the follow-up, October 13, 2006, nine years ago, 20000 uh, and 3000 for the lab fees, $23,000 total grant, and um, they never, after uh, that call, Jack never responded, so we didn't want to keep nagging him. So, uh, But we ha we've heard a rumor, and it's not just like a rumor you hear from you know your cousin when you're playing softball. Uh, we heard a rumor from people within the paleontology field that Mary Schweitzer has carbon-14 dated some of her soft tissue, uh, but that she has not published the results. So we keep repeating that rumor and hoping that she will uh, because others are. Others are, and just like we expect from dinosaur bones, the Mosasaur was carbon-14 dated, and they found plenty of modern carbon in that Mosasaur which is what we'd expect being biblical creationist. So I want to thank you guys. It's an honor to be here with you. And thank you, Dr. Vern Bissell, for inviting me. May God bless you guys.